Hello, I'm Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute at Washington State University. And on behalf of the Institute, I wanna welcome you out to our event today, which is gonna feature Stephen Caliendo, who will be discussing what can be done to address the problems of inequality in the United States. This is the last event in the Foley Institute's semester long series on the politics of inequality, which has examined the causes, consequences, and perceptions of rising inequality in the US and around the world. As many of you know, economic disparities in this country have reached levels that we've not seen in over a century. Last year, the wealthiest 50 Americans had more wealth than the bottom 50%, or 165 million Americans combined. Moreover, the pandemic, the Time's Up movement, uh, Black Lives Matter protests, and other recent events all highlight nagging problems with racial, gender, social class, geographic, and other forms of inequality. There's no doubt that the growing severity, both in the reality and perceptions of inequality, are giving rise to populist politics and social polarization in the United States and elsewhere. Our series on the politics of inequality began with a distinguished lecture by the Nobel Prize economist, Angus Deaton from Princeton University, and has included nearly a dozen other lectures by distinguished scholars and commentators on various aspects of inequality, including today's discussion about what we can do to address these problems. If you want more information about this series or any of our events at the Foley Institute, please visit us at foley.wsu.edu. And if you miss these events, you can see them later on the Foley Institute's YouTube channel. Let me also thank the College of Arts and Sciences at WSU for their continued support of the Foley Institute and their support of this series. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce today's guest. Stephen Caliendo currently serves as the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and as a professor of political science at North Central College in Naperville, Illinois. He is a graduate of Clarion University and earned a master's and PhD degree in political science from Purdue University. Stephen is the author of numerous articles and several books, including Race Appeal, How Candidates Invoke Race in Political Campaigns, which was published by Temple University Press, Teachers That Matter, which was published by Prager, and Inequality in America, Race, Poverty, and Fulfilling Democracy's Promise, published by Rutledge, now in its third edition, and which served as a textbook for a class associated with our fall series on the politics of inequality. Dr. Caliendo is also co-editor of the Rutledge Companion to Race and Ethnicity, now in its second edition. Dr. Caliendo has indicated he plans to speak for 30 or 40 minutes, and after that, we'll have some time for questions. If you have questions, I encourage you to send those to me at T.S. Foley, that's as Tom S. Foley, T.S. Foley at wsu.edu. So Stephen, I'm gonna turn the time over to you now and I'll be back with some questions from our audience in a few minutes. That's great, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Clayton. Um, it's so nice to be with you, virtually with you, of course. Um, uh, talk to, thanks to Dr. Elgar as well and for all the good folks at the, uh, at the Foley Institute. Uh, it's, it's somewhat intimidating uh, looking at the list of speakers that have participated in this series uh, over the course of the semester, certainly the the Washington State students and, uh, and, and your generosity of making this open to the public. Uh, everybody has benefited uh, from having uh, those important words uh, contemplating uh, you know, what may be the most pressing issue of our time. And so it is um, in, in some cases a, a little overwhelming to, to think about wrapping up the semester for you. Uh, but I hope I have, uh, I'm gonna do things a little bit differently. I'm gonna um, twist things up a little and uh, hopefully uh, create uh, the space for us to have a very meaningfully discussion. Uh, when I was first uh, approached to, to do this talk, I was going to be the first speaker. <laughs> and there was, there's a lot of weight to that as well. And now uh, that, I, that I'm sort of cleaning up, uh, this, is, uh, this is a different sort of weight. And so, but I'm excited, I'm excited to do it. Uh, so let me just go over quickly the agenda uh, that, that I have uh, for you uh, today. Uh, we're going to uh, spend a little bit of time on, um, uh, figuring out exactly wh wh who I am. Uh, and, I, and, I, and that'll make more sense, I think, in, in a little while, uh, because I, I typically don't spend a lot of time talking about myself in general, but certainly when I'm giving, asked to come give a lecture, it's not about me, it's, it's about what I can offer. But there's a particular reason why I'm going to spend more time than usual talking about myself. And then I'm going to give 
uh, a bit of an overview uh, of systemic inequality in the United States. A very quick one, though, because you, you spent the whole semester on this. But I want to uh, just situate a, a few things and, and talk about the extent to which this is a political problem, as opposed to purely an economic issue, purely a social issue, a cultural issue, et cetera, what makes it political. And then this is where it gets a little bit odd. I'm going to talk about the extent to which it might lead us to existential contemplation. I promise not to get too deep into philosophy because I'm not, uh, I'm not particularly well suited to do that. But I do think it's a moment for us to reflect, uh, reflect on our, our own uh, existence uh, as, as people, uh, not, not only in the world, but in a democracy and what our responsibilities are. And I, I hope to convince you uh, of the utility of that uh, well, as we move forward. And then the big question, what can we do about it? Um, there, there is somewhat an implicit promise of, of a talk like this that I'm going to say how, how we fix it. I, I can't do that, of course. If I, if I knew that, um, uh, I'd be off doing that only. Uh, lots of people for many, many years have been wrestling with these questions, but I do think I can provide some tangible solutions and offer some hope uh, of ways that uh, people, uh, young people in particular, but all people can, can maybe make a difference. Uh, I'll give some of those ideas. And then finally, um, consider the role of an ally. What does it mean to be an ally to the extent that, that we each hold some level of privilege? Um, how, how does that matter for us? Okay, let me give you a little bit of my background. I don't, uh, again, I don't typically spend this much time talking about myself, but, but this is important to sort of situate um, what we're doing here today. Um, I identify as white. Um, Italian American primarily. Uh, my uh, on both sides of my family, my mother and my father's side. My mother's side, um, my maternal grandmother was Irish, um, uh, so I would say culturally Italian. Um, but uh, that's that's essentially uh, how I how I identify in terms of my ethnicity. I am cisgender. Uh, I am male. My pronouns are him and his. Uh, I'm heterosexual. I'm middle class. I mean, we may add. Onto those uh, identities and privileges, I'm more or less neurotypical, and um, uh, I think uh, I think about able-bodiedness in a traditional sense, for instance. Uh, so um, we, we probably could spend a lot of time on that. I was born and raised uh, in the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area, so I've been in Chicago for almost 20 years now. It feels like home, um, but the Western Pennsylvania area is uh, is where I grew up. Um, my parents were married uh, throughout my childhood. Um, they both held uh, low to middle wage, uh, white collar jobs. Uh, they did not go to college. And so I was a first generation college student. Although, as I explained to students here at North Central, uh, they weren't called first generation college students when I went to college. They were just called people whose parents didn't go to college. <laughs> and we didn't talk a lot about it. I think one of the wonderful things about what's happened over the last decade or so is uh, first generation college students embracing that as an identity and understanding that the potential to disrupt. Uh, cycles of poverty uh, as a result of earning a college degree uh, for their families is, is really an important thing. And so um, uh, I've really been pleased with that movement. And we, we've done a lot of that at North Central College. I went to a, a state school. Uh, Pennsylvania has a system of, four, of 14 state institutions. Although, interestingly, we just found out in the last month that my institution, my alma mater, Clarion University, will exist no more. Uh, soon it's going to be merging with uh, two other regional universities uh, for uh, some efficiency sake. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, that gives you a little bit of an idea of, um, of, of where I went to school. I didn't go to a, a, a prestigious flagship institution, but I, I didn't go to a small liberal arts college like a North Central College um, either. Uh, my graduate work, uh, as, uh, as Dr. Clayton said, was at uh, Purdue University. I earned my master's and PhD uh, from Purdue. Um, I, my first job was at the University of Missouri St. Louis. I was a visiting professor there for three years and then I was on the tenure track for four years in a small Catholic school in Kansas City called Avila University. It's a great place. Uh, I would have stayed there but for personal reasons I needed to relocate a little closer to Chicago and so I've been living in Chicago uh, and teaching in the western suburbs uh, since 2005 uh, here at North Central College. I first joined the faculty here as a political scientist and uh, in 2016, I was named the inaugural dean of the College of Arts and Sciences uh, as we've had uh, when we had a restructuring. Okay, so how about early influences? There's lots of them, too many to list, uh, but I got some uh, some great images here, some people that you might know. In the center of your screen is Fred Rogers, sort of a local hero in Western Pennsylvania, but of course had an outreach um, toward uh, many, many more uh, because of his uh, public broadcasting television show, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Um, you know, as a little kid, I don't know that we fully appreciate the, how radical Fred Rogers was in his time in terms of um, uh, engaging young people in, in meaningful ways uh, on very difficult issues with respect, with dignity, 
um, certainly pushing some racial boundaries in the 1970s in ways that other people on television were not doing. Um, and, and really just approaching the world with a sense of wonder, curiosity, and ultimately kindness. Um, and it was a, a, a really a beautiful model, I think, for, for young children and uh, you know, the way he was able to relate to young children. So that was, a, he was a meaningful influence for me. As the older I got, uh, music mattered very much to me. I'm not a musician myself, uh, although you may be interested to know, I, maybe not, that, that, I, that I learned my first instrument during the pandemic. I did on, I've been doing online guitar lessons and uh, learning to play guitar. So I'm not very good at it. And you won't be, you won't be having any of that happening here uh, during this lecture. But um, uh, I wasn't a musician, but I cared very much about music. Um, not as much pop music, although, you know, like everybody else, I, I listened to the radio as a child. But as I became a teenager, I, I became really interested in hip hop music and uh, punk rock music. And uh, so we have uh, on the screen uh, a picture of The Clash, just representing one of the many punk rock bands, bands that um, desi decided to push the boundaries of content, um, talking about politics and, and power imbalances uh, very explicitly in their music, and then also creating music uh, that pushed boundaries and, and was challenging in, in a number of ways. And I uh, have Chuck D on the screen. I picked this picture of him because he has a Pittsburgh Pirates hat on. <laughs> but of course, he's from New York, uh, but uh, of, the, of the group Public Enemy. Uh, and of course, they were one of the, one of the earliest bands that, that were uh, rock group, or I'm sorry, hip hop groups that were socially conscious, uh, again, pushing boundaries, uh, really challenging the audience to, to think, uh, to reflect. Uh, I can't tell you how many times that um, not just uh, Public Enemy, but other hip hop groups, when I was a kid, I had to go look stuff up. Uh, making references in their music uh, that I didn't know about because I hadn't learned about because my primarily white high school hadn't taught me about. And so uh, trips to the library, we didn't have the internet in the 1980s, but uh, trips to the library to find out about those things. And I, I think those all affected me in, in very meaningful ways in terms of the substance, right? That I, that I want to push against injustice in, in lots of ways. And I want to do it with kindness and embrace people, but also the, the curiosity that it built up and, and my desire to infect others uh, with my level of curiosity, I think pushed me into academia. So all of those things, again, it's more about me than I'm, I'm usually comfortable sharing, uh, not because I'm, I'm shy, but because I, that's not what you came here for. But as I hope you'll see by the time I get to the end of this talk, I'm trying to model something in particular by, by openly reflecting on, on what my background is, what my identities are, what my very early uh, intellectual influences are, because I think that might matter. Uh, and in, in terms of my scholarly interest, as I became a political scientist, uh, my, my first work as a graduate student really centered on political socialization. Uh, how do people know what we know? How do we learn what we learn with respect to politics um, and public opinion? And then I settled into sort of the study of political communication, particularly mass media effects or the effects of uh, campaign communication. And I approached that from a political psychology perspective. Uh, that means that I'm employing psychological principles, uh, cognitive psychology, but other, other aspects of psychology too. And more than that, um, I'm using methods uh, that are most appropriate in psychology, experimental design in particular, that is isolating as much as we can to try to isolate, um, and to try to get, uh, get to effects of particular aspects of, of communication. My work focuses on race and ethnicity, politics of race and ethnicity, particularly in the context of US political campaigns. And I'm increasingly interested in, in, a, in a subfield that's kind of been called neuropolitics. Uh, what are the physiological responses uh, that people have to being exposed to particular messages or images, et cetera? And how might we understand uh, from a neuroscience perspective how that might affect our political attitudes uh, and ultimately our political behavior? Um, I think with respect to studying inequities uh, in race and ethnicity and gender, I think there's a lot of promise in, in what's been happening. Uh, in the neuroscience community broadly, but, but certainly in this intersection between sociology, political science, and, uh, and psychology and neuroscience. More broadly, I'm interested in, in, in critical race theory, feminist theory, queer theory. I say uh, more broadly because I'm not trained at all uh, as a researcher in those areas. I don't engage in that work uh, as a primary investigator, but I'm just interested in what those folks are doing, what they're saying. Um, and I'm, um, I'm delighted uh, to have my, my um, my boundaries pushed in that way to be able to think about those very complicated things in the ways those kinds of uh, writers uh, uh, encourage me to do that. Uh, so here's just a, a few um, uh, book titles. Uh, there, uh, uh, I, I think we, we had mentioned in the in the bio, but I just wanted to show you what, what some of those things look like. Um, don't have to 
don't have to spend a lot of time there. Okay, so it's worth just spending a moment then to reflect on uh, the element of, of inequality that is political. Um, and that is uh, all aspects of inequality don't, um, don't have to set, the discussion doesn't have to center on politics. I hesitated there for a moment because I think they are inherently political. So I don't mean to suggest that some parts are political and some parts aren't. I think it's all political. Um, maybe that's my bias as a political scientist that I see the world that way. But um, it's really important that we take time and think about what, what makes it political. So to say something is political, kind of, to me, it means two things. One, it means that the government, there's government involved in some, in some way, and there's power involved in some way maybe hierarchical power, maybe other kinds of power. Think about this, the, the last, the, you know, the famous last law definition of, of politics, who gets what, when, and how. In a democracy, of course, the structural ideal is that power comes from the people, and then that power is applied uh, by government, a government that's also populated uh, by uh, people. Um, but I think to identify inequality, poverty, racism, patriarchy, et cetera, as political issues, is to recognize that whatever interpersonal power dynamics might be at work, that is, no matter what my relationships with people are in my day-to-day -day life, they're all informed and constrained by broader cultural and governmental elements. So it's not that we don't have free will, of course, but that free will is constrained, uh, our, our ideas are constrained, our behavior is constrained by cultural norms, by institutions. And that's when, when we talk about systemic inequality, those are the kinds of things that we're getting at. People matter, no question, especially in a democracy, but we're not all that matters. And so it's the structural part that, that so I want us to think about our place in the world and our communities and how that place is informed and ultimately constrained by larger structural mechanisms and forces. Um, so th this is it. This is important, uh, but but um, I don't. Let's not forget um, where we came from. So in in the sense that throughout the semester, what you've learned, um, this this cycle that I have, which is a part of the book, um, is uh, you could be called a cycle of disadvantage, but it's really a cycle of advantage and disadvantage. The interrelationship between um, being able to afford to live in a particular neighborhood how living in that neighborhood uh, informs uh, what kind of high school experience one has. Not just, uh, not just uh, whether or not it's a, a well-funded high school or not, um, but, but to the extent that we're well-prepared uh, to get into college and to succeed once in college as a result of what that high school experience is. Uh, most of the country uh, overwhelmingly funds um, K through 12 schools, public schools uh, with property tax dollars, right? So it's not, it's not, uh, it's not um, a stretch um, to understand why um, poorly funded schools are situated in, poor, in, in neighborhoods where the economics are poorer uh, and better funded schools are in wealthier neighborhoods. So how, what is, how does that affect then opportunities in college and abilities to succeed in college when we know that a college degree has an effect on uh, the kind of jobs that one can secure and the kind of uh, income that one can make, which affects, of course, where you live and the cycle continues. So I, I sometimes tell students, you can think of it as a cycle of disadvantage and to the extent it is, then we look for places we might disrupt that cycle. But it's more than that. Um, it is, uh, it's a cycle of advantage as well. Uh, there, once you're in it, uh, it's hard to get out. Uh, if you're in it in a disadvantaged way, it's hard to break it. If you're in it in an advantaged way, uh, you usually end up uh, doing um, pretty well. So what makes it political, right? We've talked about that. I have the image here of the US Capitol uh, because we're talking about uh, US inequality primarily here, but your whole series was not on that. You had uh, international examples, international speakers uh, in this series. And I wanna, I wanna make sure that I acknowledge that. Um, it's important to remember that inequality in the US is more than an issue for the federal government to consider. We need to consider how state and local governments, first of all, respond. And we also need to think beyond the borders of the US. So our talk today, again, is, is limited to inequality in the US. It was important to keep in mind that especially in a globalized economy, political decisions of foreign actors and US foreign policy is quite relevant. Okay, so I titled this talk, Staring at the Sea, and I need to explain a little bit about where that comes from. Uh, first of all, it's an intentional reference to the 1978 song called Killing an Arab uh, by The Cure. Uh, which is itself a reference uh, to the 1942 novella, The Stranger, by French writer and thinker Albert Camus. So Camus, of course, was an existentialist, which will be relevant to us today. 
Uh, he's also an absurdist, which is really somewhat remote uh, from from what we want to talk about today. It might be interesting, but it's a very, but it'd be a very different talk. So I just want to be clear: that the goal here is not to apply Camus uh, to this topic of inequality. There's there's a different reason why I've introduced it this way. I'm seeking to situate what I feel is an existential moment, particularly for those of us who embody privileged identities. I think we're in an existential moment. The Stranger, the novella, deals with a French man who's the narrator, it's a first person account, who shoots and kills an Arab uh, in Algeria, uh, on a beach in Algeria. So the song that references the book sets the scene also in the first person by noting that the narrator is staring at the sea, um, which is where I pulled the title for this talk. By the way, I, it's not a coincidence that the person killed in the book and in the song is an Arab. In other words, uh, otherness, the otherness of the victim of the crime is essential to the contemplation of the main character uh, in the book and uh, who perceives himself as a quote unquote, a stranger, all right? But the image that emerges though of staring at the sea, standing there, staring out at the ocean or at the sea, uh, even here uh, in my backyard, Lake Michigan, uh, it's large enough that you, know, you can't see the other side of it. So it feels like you're, you're staring at this massive body of water and think about the power associated with it. Um, that image is consistent with the feeling that people often have when completing courses, or lectures like this, or, or finishing books on this topic, we feel small, we feel insignificant. Before we understand that inequality is systemic, I think we often feel empowered to do what we can in our own orbits, to eliminate prejudice, to eliminate hatred. But once we realize how baked into the system these advantages and disadvantages are, then we feel disempowered, we feel deflated. So we have a collective existential consideration of who we are, collective existential consideration of who we are as a nation or as a community. And then we have an individualized existential question of what can I do? What can I, little person standing on the beach, staring at the sea? All of this can be overwhelming, which can either lead to deep, even existential contemplation, which is what I'm encouraging today, or it can lead us to being frozen and not doing anything at all, which has been a real and persistent problem for generations. So I'm encouraging reflection. I'm going to add one more layer uh, to this that will push us in that direction. I'm just wrapping up my sophomore level course on political psychology. In fact, uh, today, just after this lecture is my final, final meeting of the semester. It always makes me sad because I really enjoyed uh, being with these students. As a dean, I don't get to teach very often. Uh, in fact, we're using the third edition of a book co-authored by two uh, Washington State political psychologists, Martha Kahneman and Thomas Preston, in that book, uh, just as a coincidence. So we, we begin and end that course with Stanley Milgram's important and controversial study about obedience to authority. Many of you watching today are familiar with this. I don't want to take a long time uh, to describe it, but, I, but for those of you who don't know it, I need to, I need to say a little bit about it. Um, Milgram, of course, was, um, I shouldn't say of course, Milgram was interested uh, in learning what might have contributed uh, to the Holocaust uh, under the Nazis in, in, during World War II. How could ordinary Germans allow what happened uh, to the Jews to, to happen um, uh, with, within, you know, within, their, within their time frame? Um, and so he, he set up a, an experiment, a psychological experiment, where um, he uh, put a call out for, for, for volunteers and people came uh, to Yale University and uh, to a lab. And he told them they were participating in, a, uh, in an experiment about teaching and learning. And um, he, he told them that they would randomly uh, pick slips of paper out of, uh, of a researcher's hand uh, and they would determine whether they were the teacher or the learner. It was rigged. Uh, they were always going to be the teacher because the learner was a Confederate. The learner was part of the experiment. And they, they, they take the learner to a back room and, and strap him into a chair where he can't move um, and, and uh, let, let them know that they're going to be issuing electric currents uh, toward this learner uh, to the extent that he uh, answers questions incorrectly to try to instigate better learning of some word pair questions that they're explaining. And so what you see on your screen there uh, is, is uh, the, the, the Confederate being strapped in and you see one of the participants, but you see the shock board. That's at Stanley Milgram standing by the shock board. Uh, and, the, and the board was um, comprised of a number of levers, as you can see, uh, that ranged from 15 volts up to 450 volts. Of course, there were no volts at all. No, nobody was actually being shocked, but the participants didn't know that. And they were asked to, every time uh, they uh, read the word pairs and every time the learner got a wrong answer, to move one level up on the shock board. And that part's really important. There were increments of 15 volts. 
So it wasn't that they sat down and the first thing they said was go to 450 volts, which by the way, on the shock board, I don't think you can see it here very well, but it's labeled like XXX danger, extreme danger, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, what Milgram found was, was, was disturbing. Uh, he, he did a number of iterations of this with different variables, but he found that uh, well over half the participants uh, were willing to go to the end of the shock board. And uh, I should be careful. They weren't willing to go. Uh, they uh, reluctantly went. Uh, nobody gleefully uh, shocked anybody up to 450 volts, but there were various points on the shock board where people wanted to stop um, and complained to the person in the room, the researcher wearing a white lab coat uh, and said, I don't want to do this anymore. This, this, this person he starts screaming at one point saying, my heart's bothering me. At some point he stops, uh, the learner stops responding at all. And they say, I want to quit. And the, the, of course, the researcher is part of the experiment has, has a, a list of responses that, that include things like you must continue. The experiment requires that you continue. Uh, the shocks may be painful, but they're not dangerous. Please continue. Uh, and again, more than half the participants uh, continued on to 450 volts, but, but they didn't all. And, I, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment. So the, the conclusions he draws should rattle us. What it means, of course, is that we cannot trust ourselves to do uh, what in any other context we would believe is the right thing. Uh, as I say this to you now, I'm sure you're all thinking, and I'm sure all the folks that participated in this study, hundreds of them, uh, were thinking they would never, if they walked into a room and were told to shock somebody, they wouldn't do it. But they did. Lots of them did. And so we can't know for sure. We can believe that we wouldn't, or we can, we can believe that we'd stop at some point, but we can't know for sure. So we can't trust ourselves to do what we, in other contexts, we believe is the right thing, but neither are we helpless or completely at the mercy of systems. Many participants did in fact break off from the experiment. The question we will have is, would we be able to? And if so, when? One of the aspects of Milgram's work that isn't discussed as much is the variables that he used to examine proximity. He had different iterations where the proximity uh, to the person in the lab coat was different, either sitting in the room or talking on the telephone in a different room or even a tape recorder that gave instructions. And as you might imagine, people were much more willing to break off as they got further away in proximity from the researcher. On the other hand, he also manipulated proximity of the, of the person to the extent that sometimes you could hear them through the wall, other times you couldn't at all. And in one particular iteration, uh, they were in the same room and you had to put their hand on the shock plate. Uh, people were much more likely to break off if they were in the room with the person and had to put the hand on the shock plate than if they were separated on a wall and couldn't see the person, right? So that's important because distance usually doesn't help us to be self-reflective, let alone set out to disrupt systems. We have to immerse ourselves in the conversation to the greatest extent possible. And I'll have some specific ideas in a few moments. But we can use the shock board as a metaphor. When will we break off? When will we feel that we should break off? How will we resist the pressure to continue? Where will we get the courage, for instance? We can imagine then systemic advantage and disadvantage maybe as the shock board because the effects of our privilege are often incremental. There's inertia there. We're propelled along and less than until we are called to interrupt it. I'm starting to drift into a Newtonian metaphor now. So I don't wanna make my metaphors too much, but I hope you understand what I'm trying to do. What can we do and how can we do it? In my inequality book, I have two series of boxes. Uh, I didn't want to have boxes, but I was convinced by the editor of the first edition that they were a good idea. I thought as a teacher, I never really liked boxes, but it did allow me to, to highlight some certain things. So I have one set of boxes that focuses on representing. And this helps the reader to understand how the issues raised are related to government and politics. The other is designed to address the question we're wrestling with today. What can I do? In most of the chapters, I offer small suggestions of ways individuals can address inequality that's related to that chapter. The idea is to not to provide an exhaustive list, of course, but to stimulate creative thinking so that readers feel more empowered. And this, what you're seeing here, is a list of each of the what can I do boxes in the third edition of the book. And there were different ones uh, in the first two editions. So I want to zoom in on uh, just three of these that I think provide a range of what we can do and how we can do more. I'll quickly review two of them and spend just a little more time on the last one, which I think is most important. Um, too often when professors uh, think about graduate degrees, I feel, I mean, again, other, other faculty could disagree with me, but I feel that we think about the kind of graduate degrees that we got research degrees, research graduate degrees. But there are a lot of professional master's degrees that can open doors to a variety of opportunities that sometimes feel hidden. So I don't wanna to mention too many specifics for fear that I'm looking like I'm promoting particular programs. Uh, but in general, I wanna suggest that a review of programs in public policy, urban affairs, urban planning, a variety of other fields can lead to jobs where there's a real chance 
to make a difference in this area. And I point this out because some of those jobs are invisible relatively, unless you know somebody that's in them or you have, you know, again, in my world, uh, I, didn't, I didn't interact with a lot of people with college degrees when I was young. I didn't know those kinds of jobs. Um, and these are the kinds of jobs that typically aren't on TV. They're not represented in popular culture, in film, in television shows, et cetera. But they're jobs that can really make a difference. Uh, you have some grad programs right there at Washington State that fit the bill here. I think the Global Justice and Security Studies Certificate is a good example. Certificates are another interesting credential, right? It's not a full degree, uh, but it's a way of having a conversation or, or having a notation um, that can open the door to a number of different things. Uh, you also have a program in, in public affairs, the MPA program, for instance. I'm sure there are others. So look for unique interdisciplinary graduate opportunities to help launch you into fields that you might not even know exist. Um, and I think a lot of this really is interdisciplinary and more and more colleges and universities are looking for those unique um, graduate opportunities to, to hook students in and to provide a credential that'll be a jumping off point because they know that so many young people uh, want to, uh, whatever they end up doing with their lives, that, that it makes a difference, that it, that it challenges uh, systems of oppression, et cetera. Okay, well, I'm not suggesting, of course, that baking is the specific thing that will make a difference here, uh, but I chose this particular not-for-profit uh, as one example in, in the third edition of my book because it's a really great example of how creativity and leveraging talent can make a difference in a community. Uh, this is a group that was founded in 2010 by two women with training in mental health and a desire uh, for social justice. So together we bake seeks to, uh, this is from them, quote, provide a comprehensive workforce training and professional development program to help women gain self-confidence, transferable work skills, and invaluable hands-on experience, end of quote. So all of this is designed to help uh, women to trans transition to the workforce to become self-sufficient. It invites previously incarcerated women to participate in this program and trainings and also to work at the bakery in Alexandria, Virginia. And I think what's maybe most interesting about this is that they use a scaffolding model where they have graduates of the program, people who have got women who have gone on to be successful, come back and lead workshops and teach classes and interact uh, with the folks that are in the program at the time. So it's really an interesting, just one example of a creative solution that individuals and groups can generate to disrupt the cycle of advantage a disadvantage. All right, that's a picture of a mirror. It's not a particularly creative image, but it, it does the trick. The reason I spent so much time at the beginning of this talk on my own background was because I wanted to be as transparent as I could about what identities have shaped my lived experiences. My parents didn't go to college or ever have a lot of money, and that made it difficult for me to succeed in the cycle of advantage or disadvantage. Uh, they sacrificed a lot uh, to make sure that I had an opportunity to get to a high school that was going to prepare me well for college, but that was a real challenge uh, on their part. But most of my identity, besides the fact that you know my family didn't have a lot of money, most of my identity did not work against me, and their identity did not work against them. Privilege doesn't mean absolute privilege. Not to say to say that I have privilege does not mean I am privileged. It means privilege on an identity relative to others who don't share that identity. I'm often asked why I was moved to research inequality. And when I'm interviewed, I get asked that a lot. My guess is that scholars who are visibly embody a minoritized identity are not asked about this. There's an assumption made about why they would be moved to it. The implicit suggestion, I think, for folks that are asking me this is, what's up with you? What, what is it that made you, uh, you know, a white guy who embodies all these privileges? Why do you, why do you research inequality? I think the answer is rooted in those early influence I shared with you. It's rooted in Chuck D. It's rooted in punk rock. It's rooted in Mr. Rogers. It's rooted in what my parents taught me about caring about others. I feel that this work is an ethical imperative. I have a particular set of skills, and I feel that there's an ethical imperative for me to apply those skills to help solve these problems. I honestly can't imagine not doing this work. So part of owning privilege, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, more is, is taking a close look at who is in our orbit, right? So my very last uh, box, uh, my very last what can I do box in the book is own your privilege. Part of owning that privilege is taking a closer look at who's in our orbit. What ideas, what perspectives do we consider regularly? Not every once in a while I read a book or every once in a while I go see a documentary. On a regular basis, what's the communication flow? What am I hearing? America is so geographically divided. Most of us don't live in racially and ethnically diverse areas. One of the great things about going to college is it's typically more diverse 
than where you came from. And it's probably going to be more diverse than where you're going. But I can challenge us all to examine our social networks. What ideas emerge through those social networks? What, idea, what voices are heard? Uh, how have you contributed to the echo chamber by shaping your feeds, by hiding or not friending particular people on Facebook, or more importantly, I think, uh, following people on Twitter. Twitter is probably, again, I, I hesitate to seem like I'm endorsing a particular platform, but the nature of Twitter is best suited to do this. It can be helpful in ways that other social media platforms cannot. Um, if you don't have any friends who have a different race than you, it's weird on Facebook to start asking them to be your friends. Even the language is problematic, but on Twitter, you follow people. And uh, I would say to, uh, to white men, right? There's, there's lots of women uh, intellectuals on Twitter who have great ideas that you can follow and learn from regularly. Uh, lots of black and brown men, uh, Asian men on Twitter who are sharing ideas on a regular basis. You can follow them. And that becomes part of your orbit. As you're waiting in the supermarket line or killing time and you're just scrolling through Twitter to see what's happening, think about the different things that you might be uh, coming across as opposed to what, what, what your Twitter feed might look like now. And part of owning your privilege is developing a deep sense of humility around these issues. Uh, we cannot continue to be defensive about the areas of our identity that are privileged. Just because we didn't create the privilege or even request it, doesn't mean that we're not affected by it. This is what I mean by the humility part. So the word ally is thrown around a lot and there's a scholarly literature around it. But for our purposes today, I think it'll suffice to define the terms as being prepared to work alongside minoritized members of our community to disassemble the structures that offer us privilege, unearned privilege. It sounds relatively easy, but if you're doing it right, it's not easy. It can be painful to hear about areas where we fall short, especially because we believe that we're well-intentioned. In fact, we probably are well-intentioned, but we need to be willing to have our blind spots identified for us. And we've got to be willing to do the work that helps us to identify our own blind spots. We need to surround ourselves with people who can trust us enough to be honest so that we can continue to grow. And most important, we need to remember that this is all a process. We're never done. There's not an end line that you get to and say, okay, I've done it. Structural inequality has built over generations and our desire to be non-racist or even anti-racist, to be non-sexist, anti-sexist, et cetera. It's not enough. That desire is not enough to satisfy our responsibility. We need to do more and we need to do better. We need to accept this as an ethical imperative that begins with an examination of the self as well as the systems within which we operate. You can't, you got to do both of those things. If it were easy, we would have done it already. So I'm encouraging you to embrace the discomfort, embrace the challenge, and really get to work. And I'll stop there. I think Dr. Clayton may, may have some questions, but I, I put my social media um, uh, handles up there for you if anybody's interested. Okay, great. Um, maybe you can turn off your screen. Yes. Okay, so uh, so so I, let me start with what's kind of a long question, I guess. Um, you know, we started this series with Angus Deaton, uh, whose book uh, Lives of Despair talks a lot about um, the problem of white men in, yeah. in the United States. They're the people, they're the ones who are uh, actually seeing life ex expectancy decline they're the ones who uh, have stopped seeking higher education. Um, uh, they're the ones who are uh, disproportionately committing suicide and opioid abuses and, and drug abuses. Um, so, so he focuses a lot on social class, in particular, the divide between those who have degrees and those who don't. Yeah. And, and that's fallen heavy, most heavily in recent years, he argues, on, on white males. So, so I wonder how you respond to that or how you think about that problem, because you focused a lot on, on ethnic and racial minorities and women and other groups um, where are the ones, the groups that need the most help or most uh, uh, understanding. And Angus would have turned that, I think, that equation around. So, so I wonder how you think about that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, a, it's a long-standing um, 
I don't know if debate is the right word, but certainly point of discussion among folk, folks who study inequality um, to, to think about the extent to which social class or economics is really the driver or whether or not it's the culprit. And I think, you know, depending on the theoretical tradition you come from, uh, that might make a difference from a Marxist perspective. Um, you know, it's economic social systems that are going to lead to sort of disadvantage. Uh, but it, but it's but it's embedded with long histories of white supremacism and, and, and patriarchy, right? I mean, they're not, you can't disentangle them. Um, I think to the extent that there's a focus on um, those who earn a degree or have access to higher ed, um, I am very much focused on that in my, you know, I don't know what you call it. I mean, my research is part of my day job, but I'm Dean of Arts and Sciences now. I'm an administrator at a private college. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about equity issues at the college and inclusiveness and sense of belonging among our college students and uh, and our faculty and, and the staff members who work here. And um, to what extent is this available? Look, I, I, you know, we have almost half of the students at North Central College, a small private college in the Western suburbs, almost half of our students are first generation college students. I, and, and I think about the quality of the faculty we have here, the quality of the programs. I'm not here to promote North Central College, but what I'm here to say is I would have done so much better. I would have really thrived in a place like this. I had no idea I could afford it because I didn't know about financial aid. I didn't, I, the brochures come and they say what the tuition is. And it was like, compared to the state schools, I didn't even apply to places like this. I had no idea if I could have got into a Allegheny College, for instance, in Western Pennsylvania, right? Great liberal arts college. And so how do we make sure, we know we do a great job when we get students um, in terms of educating them, but we don't always make them feel welcome and, and belong. And sometimes they leave as a result of that. So that's an imperative on our point. But even before that, how do we get them in the door? How do we get them to make sure that they understand uh, when parents can't help with guidance because they haven't moved through that? It's a little better now with the internet. You know, you can make different, it's different. You don't just rely on that brochure that you, that you send away for in the mail. Um, but I think providing access, we know we can be, I have that cycle, right, that I showed and that, that that's one of the places disrupted in higher ed, right? If we can provide access to college education, uh, can, find, can change financially uh, the futures of, of, of uh, it's not the only place, but it's one of the places we can change family futures. Yeah, let me just follow up on that a little bit because uh, both Deaton and I'm also thinking, I just recently read uh, Michael Sandel's new book on the tyranny of, of merit. Oh. And he makes a similar argument in that he, his argument is that, that that you can explain much of the populist um, movement in the United States and elsewhere, but mostly in the United States, uh, as a result of, uh, and much like Angus Deaton's argument, uh, a sense that uh, individuals who don't have university degrees, it's not so much a matter of economic um, yeah. uh, disparity, although there is that, but it's mostly about um, a sense of, of, of social status, yeah. that they're not respected. And, uh, and, and so what can we, you know, I mean, we're, we're in higher education. So we, of course, want everyone to go on and get, you know, university to get yeah. higher education. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think both their arguments is we have to focus more on how can we restore a sense of dignity in, uh, for those who uh, live lives where they're not going to go on to higher education. That's right. And maybe we don't want everyone going on to higher education, right? I'm torn about I'm torn about this one, Professor, and I'll tell you why. I mean, one of the things that I think, you know, I, I talked about the financial part of it first because I think that's where, especially our first gen families, are focused. I mean, they know that this is the key. My parents knew that this was the key, and it's funny because, um, you know, the difference is we have first gen parents now asking about, you know, what are you going to do with that, you know, and, and maybe it's because we're a private school and we have a higher sticker price. But my parents never asked. I majored in English literature. And never once did they say, what are you going to do with it? They didn't care. I was going to have a college degree. Nobody else had one. They're like, you're going to do something with it, right? They didn't say, what are you going to do with that? Um, but it's not just about the economics. I think we, one of the things we do at, at college, one of the privileges of being here is learning to think differently and learning to engage with people who come from different backgrounds. And so I'm very much, you know, from, from my um, equity centered perspective, I think about that on the economic sense. We shouldn't be encouraging people to accumulate a lot of debt for four-year degrees when they could learn a trade, uh, enter into a union profession, be carpenters and HVAC folks, and, and really make good livings. And, and again, you know, probably provide uh, intergenerational wealth, et cetera. But what they're missing when they don't do that is all the, the privilege of wrestling with the big ideas and engaging with things. And I think everyone's entitled to that. 
It doesn't mean everybody, we should make everybody do it, but I think everybody who wants to uh, be a part of that should. And I think we have a stronger democracy to the extent that we have more people educated in that way. But I'm realistic that to, to, I don't want to, you know, I don't think everybody's going to be able to pay for that. And I don't think everybody should have to make that choice. But short of that, then, what kind of community education ought we be doing? What kind of other ways that we could we be engaging people in the big, meaningful issues of the day and helping them to feel empowered? You know, Paulo Freire talked very much about uh, education being a, a source of liberation, uh, right? It, it ought to not be just this sort of notion of going through the motions. Is that you changing, you're changing yourself, and then you change your communities as a result of wrestling with these big ideas. And I just don't want to lose hold of that simply because of the economics, if we can, if we can do it. Okay. So um, um, someone from our YouTube audience asks, what practical steps can a student on campus do to address inequality on a day-to-day -day basis? Are there smaller steps to start to make a difference? There are, um, uh, you know, um, I don't, I think about being in college and, and being, um, I wasn't particularly introverted or, or shy uh, but but it's still you have to put yourself out there to meet folks that are that, that, that don't look like you or that come from different backgrounds than you. I, I think what I've noticed on on the campuses I've been at is that the, the groups that are centered on uh, you know disrupting trends of disadvantage, uh, the Black Student Associations, the Muslim Student Associations, the feminist groups, etc., uh, tend not to be particularly exclusive. Uh, they're happy to have folks uh, in the ally mentality be a part of what they're doing. Uh, but it can be um, it can be scary. Uh, for people to to just show up at the meeting or or, or tap on the shoulder of somebody who's in charge of it and say, "Can I join?" Um, I, maybe social networks help with that a little bit. Maybe maybe on the, the internet can help with that. But I think you really have to we have to take ourselves out of comfort zones uh, and put ourselves in positions, and then be ready to listen and to allow ourselves to be challenged and not feel particularly defensive about it. Because I think that's the hard part: is that you go to those meetings and you hear about how people like you uh, have unearned privilege. Uh, and you have to accept that, like you didn't ask for it, you know, well, what does it mean? And then how does it manifest? But it's a tough, it's tough to ex expect young people to put themselves in that position when we have lots of choices. You could choose to stay home and watch Netflix instead. You could choose to go out with people who you know you'll be comfortable with instead. Or there's a lot of choices that make us more comfortable. What I was trying to advocate in, in this talk was embrace that discomfort, try to find places that we have an ethical responsibility to, to do that work. So I would look for those student groups. That's one place. Uh, I would also look for faculty who do research in these areas. Oftentimes, and I don't want to speak for the faculty at Washington State, I know you have a, a robust grad student population, uh, but a lot of times undergraduate students uh, have a place on research teams. Uh, and so look for the folks who are, are researching in those areas and, and ask the faculty if there's opportunities to be involved in the work that they're doing. You might be surprised at the answers they give. Okay, we have another question from uh, one of our audience members. Uh, he thanks you for your talk. And then he asks whether you think inequality is improving. And, uh, and he or she uh, writes, with a protest like the BLM um, movement uh, that we have seen recently, it doesn't seem clear to me that things are changing in a positive way. I appreciate the question. Um, I have a hard time answering it. And, and partly because, so I think about, for instance, um, Sometimes on college campuses, we have, we have uh, decisions to make in terms of how we report, for instance, sexual assault, right? And, and we may, you know, uh, it, it may be an ethical thing to have um, a wider education for our students and more robust reporting structures that end up leading to more reports of sexual assault. That doesn't necessarily mean that sexual assault went up at the college. It means that reports of sexual assault went up at the college and that, 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 that the amount of sexual assault may have stayed the same. It may have even decreased. It's impossible to know. The reason I, I lead with that example is because when I think about um, the high profile killing of black men in particular, usually black men at the hands of law enforcement, so much of this uh, changes as a result of everybody having high quality video cameras in their pockets all the time. Right. We think about what happened in 1992 with Rodney King and the terrible quality of that video. But the fact that there was a video at all. Right. That changes everything because seeing something is different than hearing a report of it. Um, and so it, it's hard for me to know. I, I don't think any realistic person would say I'd rather be living in 1955 with respect to race, ethnicity and patriarchy than 2020. I, I don't think. But but I think Patricia Ireland once said, don't confuse progress with equality. The question's a good one because I don't even know that you can say for sure that there's progress because there's such a, it's impossible to disentangle that we know more now than we used to know. Things are visible to us. That is, uh, uh, those of us who are not in disadvantaged communities 
things are more visible to us than they were before. Um, so I don't know if that, that doesn't make things worse necessarily. It means that they're the same. They're not necessarily getting better. On the other hand, you know, you, you can look at markers like percentage of people earning college degrees uh, from, you know, who are first generation or who are percentage of women earning degrees, or you can look at, um, uh, you know, average pay, or you can look, I mean, there's all kinds of markers that would suggest there's some improvements. But I don't know, you know, depending on the particular marker you're looking at, you're not going to get the same answer. And even if you get a good answer, you don't know for sure how much of it's an artifact of, of what we know now and what we're looking for and what being attentive to as compared to before when we were just either willingly, uh, you know, we were often willingly blind to it. Mm -hmm. So I have another question about, you know, I, I, I was really interested, you know, the, the pictures of Milgram uh, experiment. Mm -hmm. You, and, and it takes you back to the 1950s, right? You know, you see those guys there and it, you can see yeah. the entire milieu. And, and, I, and I wonder if the experiment would come out differently today, not because people as individuals are different, but because our society has changed so radically and uh, our institutions and authority structures uh, aren't what they used to be, right? And that's a good thing, uh, but also a bad thing. Uh, the, the good thing is, you know, maybe some of those authority structures were exclusive ones that that kept people uh, from uh, from accomplishing things in, in life, uh, and were discriminatory and all sorts of other problems. With it. On the other hand, what they did is they provided some sense of social solidarity that we were all in this together. Uh, and so, if you think about people like uh, Putman, you know, Robert Putman's work, sure, sure. Richard Rorty makes a similar argument. Uh, that sense of of so, social solidarity has evaporated with, with the decline of institutions, right? Um, and and that, that's ultimately uh, what allows us to make progress on inequality is, is a sense that we're all in this together, we're willing to make sacrifices for each other. So, so how do we address that problem? Well, you know, the, the interesting thing about the Milgram work, of course, it was so um, ethically problematic from a research methods perspective, right? It's the reason why we have institutional review boards now. Uh, and, you know, it's, 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 I always feel conflicted when I teach it because in some ways you don't want to reinforce, but on the other hand, the damage has been done. Like we have the information and it's so powerful, but the, the problem is, and what I explain to students, the reason why you can't replicate Milgram now is because the students can all leave that room thinking they'd be part of the 50% or the 40% who broke off, who, who didn't go to the end. Nobody who went to the end in the actual experiment, they have to live the rest of their life knowing what they were capable of. It's, it's horrible, right? They had to know. They knew that they, would, they, they were going to, even though they didn't want to, they knew that they went along when they thought they were shocking somebody over and over with 450 volts because a guy in a white lab coat told them to do it. So, so to your question, we can't replicate it. How, and we can't replicate it scientifically. But I will tell you, and I think people can find it on YouTube, uh, in, the, in the 2000s, this study was replicated twice. Uh, once by ABC News, I think, in one of their, one of their, you know, one of their TV shows, and then once uh, with a British television show. And, I, and again, I think they're available. You can find them on YouTube. Uh, the results were almost identical. They're almost identical. About 50% of people went the whole way and didn't break off. And, and about 50%, you know, at some point during the, during the experiment, uh, decided they weren't going to continue. So I'm not as optimistic that, you know, I, I, I wish I could be that, you know, oh, back in those days, they did whatever people told them to, you know what I mean? And so, um, you know, but, but Milgram didn't find differences really with respect to social class or with respect to gender, right? I mean, there was like all kinds of people, some people broke off irrespective and some people went the whole way to the end. Um, I think to the notion that we're not bowling in leagues anymore and that we're, you know, bowling by ourselves and so forth. I, yeah, I, I, it's hard to push back against that notion. I mean, there's um, uh, uh, that sense of empathy and connection certainly drives our desire to examine how systems might be constraining. But it's a really complicated thing. And it's you can't get it into a soundbite, which is why we don't have these meaningful conversations during U.S. presidential elections, for instance. Right. Even candidates who want to talk about this really can't do it because it's just a long form conversation. It's not, it doesn't lend itself well, not only to a campaign, right, but even in a, in a discussion at a debate, um, you, you have to presume a lot of knowledge. I mean, one of the reasons I was happy to talk last is because people have been watching this series for four months now. You know what I mean? Like I, I get the benefit of not having to explain all this stuff because they already have it. Um, but it's complicated and it's deep and it, and it, more than anything, it challenges what we, have always believed about the United States as a country, about who we are as people, 
to, to know the reality of, of how the suffering continues to take place. So we have to accept that first, which is hard, and then we have to try to figure out what to do about it. So uh, Jordan uh, emails a question. He says, is it, is it possible to tackle all these inequalities straight away? If not, which ones should we try to fix first and why? Jordan, Jordan, Jordan. <laughs> so good. Yeah, it's so good. I mean, I am... Um, I think that the, Kimberly Crenshaw helps us understand that intersectional identities matter. In other words, it's not the case that we can talk about different structural hierarchies. But whites are at the top of the racial hierarchy. Men are at the top of the gender hierarchy. Straight folks are at the top of the, of the sexual orientation. We can do that. But it's not the case that in every context that being black and being a woman is better than being black and being a male in terms of how society views you. I mean, that may be the case in some instances, but, but it's much more complicated than that. So when we think about the interrelationship between identities and how all of us probably have some level of privilege with respect to some identity or identities, and then maybe we're minoritized in other ways. Uh, I think it's really tough to, to tease them apart and say, let misogyny, that's the one, let's get that one first. And then once that one falls, then we'll sort of do the other. I, I think Jordan recognizes that too. I don't think Jordan is suggesting that we do that. Um, but it does feel overwhelming to say, oh my gosh, we have all these, you know, all these things. So much of it is non-conscious, conscious, right? So I, I give the example, and I don't know if it's in the book or not, but I give the example sometimes with students about cut curbs. When I was a kid, you didn't see the corners of curbs lower, right? They were just, they were just curbs on the street, right? And then you started to see these cut curbs and it really helps you to think, you know, it wasn't that the people who designed curbs prior to that were like, ah, the heck with somebody in a wheelchair or the heck with somebody who's pushing a stroller or that. They weren't thinking about that. It's just the people who designed them and the people that built them didn't push a lot of strollers, weren't in a wheelchair, right? I mean, it wasn't sort of part of their orbit. It wasn't that they were being intentionally harmful. It was that they were they had blinders. They didn't know. Well, now we know better. We know, we know that if we don't cut curbs, we're going to really put people at some disadvantages as they try to move around town or move around the city, et cetera. And so where are those places where we can look to cut curbs? Where are those places that we can look to chip away at some of the, because uh, it's a privilege to be able to step up on a curb uh, or to not have to haul, you know, your shopping cart or whatever that you're pushing all your belongings in up onto that curb. Where are the places where we can, where we can learn to cut curbs? Okay. Well, I think unfortunately our time is up. Um, and before I thank our, our guest, uh, let me just say, this is our last event of the semester. Uh, I, I thank you all for joining us this semester but we have a full uh, schedule of events for our next semester. And I hope to see all of you uh, when we come back in, in January to campus. Uh, now I wanna thank Stephen Caliendo again for a terrific discussion. It's exactly what we wanted as our final discussion or uh, presentation in this series to kind of sum it all up and give us something hopeful, a hopeful way to think about how we can address inequality. So thanks again, Stephen, we really appreciate it. Well, thank you all so much for having me. I really appreciate it, it was a privilege. All right, we'll see you all in January. <laughs>